I don't care what you think. You were wearing Triple G sauna suit? It's best to stay within the box. What's your favorite drink? Me? Do you have a six pack or not? I like to reply to a few haters here and there. I went to like an office with this lady. They grew up in a haunted house. No, mm -hmm. you're showing up to collect a check. I like to say it's water off a duck's ass to me. Can, can, can we talk about beauty for a second? I am a woman and we do have cleavage. Would you say you're your own worst critic? UFOs, conspiracy theory. <laughs> what? <laughs> Michelle Joy Phelps. I am so excited to have you on my podcast. You are the most high profile guest I've ever had. And I'm, I'm, I'm honestly like my, my heart is pumping right now. And <laughs> this is great. So thank you so much for allocating your time for me. Oh, of course. Thank you for asking me. It's nice to feel like we're doing something when we're stuck at home. So uh, <laughs> thank you for having me. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to talk about you because basically, I honestly... I'm using this opportunity as like, I have a podcast, but really I just want to talk to people that I always wanted to talk about. So I talked to, and so I just wanted to basically have a conversation with you as if like we would actually meet uh, just about yourself. And, and I want my listeners to kind of have a little window into your life besides just being an on camera talent, but also an off camera talent. So I just want to talk about your life. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. <laughs> sure. So, uh, I guess let's just start from the beginning. Where are you from and uh, how did you basically end up in boxing uh, as, as you currently are? Um, I was born and raised in Southern California uh, in Riverside County. And I have pretty much lived most of my childhood in a city called Marietta, which is near Temecula. Mm -hmm. uh, a small part of my life was lived in Hawaii, which... Really, nobody knows that. Um, we spent about three years living in Hawaii, Oahu. Oh, that's Then we moved to, back to Southern California. And, uh, you know, it's interesting how I kind of came about finding boxing, as they say, because I don't know if you necessarily find it. It's just when you're passionate about something, it's always there, isn't it? But, but let's, let's, we'll get back to boxing. I, I, want, like, I know that you've done some other things before. You, you've gone to school yeah. and you went to, like, a, you were an aspiring artist. I'd like to learn about that. So, Yeah, so um, I moved to Los Angeles when I was 21. And I literally had $300 to my name and was sleeping on the floor sharing a room with a friend of mine. I didn't even have a bed yet. And it's interesting because prior to me leaving, I had, I had an apartment. I had a good job. I was working at an urgent care. I went to school to be a medical assistant slash x-ray technician. I dropped out of school for the x-ray program um, just a few months shy of graduating. And it's funny because I remember when I sat down with my parents and told them I was moving to LA. Mm -hmm. I think my dad was a bit more open to it, but my mom was not having it. She was just like, why? Like you have, a, you're doing good things for yourself at such a young age. Like, why would you move to LA? Well, that's a good question. Why? why would you do it? Yeah. Like, why would you try to be an actress? Like, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just said, if I graduated from school being an x-ray technician, I would, be making really great money. Mm -hmm. And I would find myself in a job only for the sake of making good money. Mm -hmm. Not because I loved it, not because I really had a passion for doing it. I enjoyed it. It wasn't terrible, but do I think I would have been able to go forever and feel like I was fulfilled inside? Like I mm -hmm. didn't feel that. And mm -hmm. I've always, since I was a young girl, I've always wanted to be in front of the camera. I've, I've always said I was going to be a famous actress. It was really, it's really funny. Just, you know, typical kid dreams. But I've always had this sort of passion for it that I couldn't quite explain. You know, some people have a passion to be school teachers. Some people want to be lawyers, others doctors, others directors. Just mm -hmm. had this, this knack for wanting to be in front of the camera. So, mm -hmm. um, I risked everything and I moved to Los Angeles and... I left this consistent job I had of working at an urgent care to looking for waitressing jobs. That's very so brave. Like it's, you already had your life set up. You, you weren't just some, some girl from, I don't know, Arkansas or something that just like, I'm going to go to Hollywood too. Like you, you were like, okay, I'm going to exchange this 
great life that I'm potentially can like set for myself to like another one that I don't even know what's going to happen. So that's, I don't know. I, I don't think a lot of people understand how, how, I don't know how brave it is. How like it you goes to have from, a spirit for this. Yeah. It, it goes from instability. I'm, I'm sorry. Stability to instability. Just mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I've always been that way. It's interesting because my mom's always said like, you've always sort of, when you were young, I always thought it was just like, you're just being a young girl, like talking, you know, we all have big dreams. Mm-hmm. She's like, when you were young, you always used to say, I'm going to be, I'm going to move to England. I'm going to move to England. And she's like, nobody in our family's ever been to England. So yeah. What's we, up with that? By the way, I've read so many times that you love England so much from the, you were yeah, like, I don't know. I, I, I swear if, if, if I believed in past lives, which I don't believe, but if, if there is such thing as past lives, I'm pretty sure I came from England because it's like, <laughs> I have this, this draw to be there. It's interesting. But I always said it as a young girl. I always said I was going to move to England. And again, parents didn't understand it. Love right. Prince William. I swore I was going to marry him. And um, I, it's interesting to see how at such a young age, I sort of always knew what I wanted to do. I, mm-hmm. I didn't realize it then. I realize that now. I've always just sort of knew that... I wanted to do what I'm doing now. And Mm -hmm. I guess I didn't have that full realization until my mid twenties. Anyways, I'm in Hollywood. I'm now waitressing, bartending, working odd jobs. Um, It was a challenge. It was rough. I mean, I I could say that there's been many times where I've contemplated like, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I making my life difficult? It didn't have to be this difficult. Yeah. I could have had, you know, a really high paying job. I probably could have owned a home in a few years. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, of course, but there was something within me that, and still till right now, I can't quite explain it, but it's like, I just always knew I needed to do this. I needed to go in this direction. Even when it felt like all odds were against me as if, everything's telling me not to do it, but I'm the only one who understands why I'm doing it. And I just want everyone to understand like how strong of an emotion it is. When I came to California when I was 17, I was all about that, you know, life. Like, wow, Los An- I was in Santa Barbara, so very close to Los Angeles. And I was like acting, movies and all that. I was just in an English school, like learning English. And so there was like a casting thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know, for something. So I went and so you know i did like I, i'm not an actor or anything i was 17 i was just like i'm just gonna do it this is yeah. fun and they're like you know they asked me to do like a commercial like a like a kind of a how do you say it like a, an example right like oh, read this like, lines or something like that you know yeah. and then like and then like uh show yourself on the camera and then turn around like do this and then i went to like an office with this lady and she's like okay do you have a six pack or not like that's the first question she asked me <laughs> And and I didn't have any like six pack or anything like that. I wasn't like any tone at all. But like that was just so like whoa. Like I don't know. I got like discouraged. I was like ah, this is like it's so demanding. And and you know, and it was just like a one time thing. And I, I you know they said no to me. And I and I just I don't know. I was like all right, screw this. I will never do this again. Like it's, yeah. it's just you know so what? easy to quit. It's really so easy to quit. I mean, one thing I'll say about myself is. I'm probably one of the strongest people I even know, honestly. I'm not just saying that. I really mean, like, I have so much resilience in me. When you tell me I can't do something, I promise you that I will. And I've always been that way. Every time I've had adversity staring me right in the face, basically saying it's impossible, it's impossible, I find a way where it becomes possible. But that also comes down to my faith. Like, I'm, I believe in God and... And there's been trying times. And I'll tell you one thing, every single time a door's closed, a relationship's ended, uh, you know, I, I got told no, something better came from the situation. And I always sort of felt that there was this sort of favor and protection over me, I guess you could say, where God's always directed me in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Every time something felt wrong, I went with what I felt. I never questioned it. I don't try to go around it. If it doesn't feel right, I'm not doing it. And and because of that, I sort of found myself always on the path or near the path that I should be on. I know no one's perfect. No one could, everyone sort of strays here and there, but 
overall, I don't think I've ever fallen too far away from the road I'm supposed to be on. But I, again, I credit that down to my faith because when there were those trying times, I really listened to like the inner voice, the spirit to, to tell me and lead me in the right direction. Um, there was one time I was, I remember I was about $500 short in rent. It was due the next day. I was a waitress and I know that on average we make about 300 a day, but it was never like 500, 600. Like it just, it just didn't happen with where I was working. Right. In, in tips. Yeah. In tips. So I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to be late on my rent. What am I going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm in this really bad position. And every time I, I am very specific with what I ask for, I always manage to get it down straight down to the number. Right. Mm -hmm. It's so funny because when I prayed about, it, I prayed really, really hard. I was literally probably the one memory I can look back on and, and recall that aha moment with myself. Mm -hmm. And I was crying and I said to God, I mean, in, there's anger and frustration and confusion and everything in me. And I said, if this is not, if I'm not supposed to be moving in this direction, if I'm not supposed to be acting, trying to act, doing print work, if this is the wrong field, could you just tell me? Because I don't want to waste my time. You have a right? conversation with God. Yeah. I'm literally like, I'm frustrated now. Cause I'm thinking like, I get it. They say it's, it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. But this is just getting like ridiculous now. Like I'm like, I'm feeling completely hopeless and I'm now asking for that. And I'm not going to say it was words in my ear. It was like this saying popped into my head. It was, it was definitely a, like a spiritual moment because I'll always remember this quote and it popped into my head. Again, it wasn't some voice in my ear, but it was like, and I wrote it down immediately because I knew I was going to forget. Mm -hmm. And what it, what it said was, dreams are fulfilled to those who remain loyal to their craft and disloyal to those who fall short of the determination. Yes, I read this quote uh, when I was doing a research on you and I also found it very like, whoa, like it, it, those are like some strong words. And, and honestly, it's like those words are not from our time. Like it's just... Yeah. A, but it's like, it, it basically, it says, it's up to you. There is, again, it's life. We are given the cho we're given the option of choice. Do you know what I mean? Like, we can choose our destiny. What do you want to do? It said, dreams are fulfilled to those who remain loyal to mm -hmm. their craft. So do you want it? Then remain loyal to it. If you believe in yourself, then keep doing it. If you really think you got it, keep going. Mm -hmm. And so... That, and that still gives me chills when I think about it because that was not me. That was not a quote I, I came up with. It was something that came into my head in the very moment that I was on my knees praying in tears. So I've always applied that to everything I do. As long as I remain loyal to what I'm doing and I'm passionate about what I'm doing and I believe in what I'm doing, I'm not unrealistic with my beliefs or my demands either. Very realistic, in fact, that I believe that we can achieve anything we set our minds out to. And I remember that that night I had, uh, I had to work. Uh, just and I remember being like, I swear, I, I can't even remember the specific dollar. Let's just say $503 short on rent. By the time I finished my shift, I had some big time tippers come in. And I ended up making the exact doll to the dollar after I tipped out the, you know, bar back and the bar. Right, you have to spread that. I walked the home with the exact amount that I was short on rent. And I swear to you, that's why I always joke and say, be very specific with what you want in life because you will get it. But are you ready for it? Is it something that right. you know that you're ready for? ready to tackle. And, and in this case, if it's something that you really need, like I need a new car, be specific about what kind of car, because you could say I want a new car and get the car you never wanted, but you got a car. So it's sort of like, that's, it's a lesson in that. So with that said, I've always applied all of that to my life. So Michelle, and you, uh, 
you're always open with your religion and you you've said that your favorite book is bible and you uh you share you share bible quotes on on your social media yeah. which is not really a popular trend trend nowadays especially you know in, in in california for example in the show show business is that something that you sort of were you always that open about your religious beliefs yeah look i'm not perfect by any means necessary i mean i'm not going to sit here and pretend to be like I'm the perfect example of what you would call a Christian, but I'm, I'm loyal in the sense of, I believe what I believe and I'm not going to lie about it because it makes someone else uncomfortable or it's taboo. I am who I am authentically hundred percent. What you see in the interviews, the personality you see, that's exactly who I am when I get off camera. Do you know what I mean? Because I've, I've tried to apply the authenticity across the board in my life. You either love me or hate me. It does not matter. I am who I am. So I do get people who will DM me and say, oh, God's not real. And this, I don't care what you think. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing what I believe and what I, what I feel in the moment. If I felt inspired to share a quote, if I felt inspired to share a, a Bible verse, then I'm going to do it. And I don't hold any shame to that. And I don't think anybody should. You should be who you are. And, and again, I have friends who are atheists, uh, Muslim, uh, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, uh, you name it, Catholic. Uh, I, don't, I don't look at them any differently because they pray differently or they do or don't believe in the same God as I do. I don't care. I, I, I embrace the, the, the different cultures and mentalities of everybody. But not everyone has that same mentality in return. They're very judgmental and they want to kind of keep you in a box. And I noticed that, especially in, in the fields that I'm in, uh, women in sports, we're sort of, it's best to stay within the box. Just, just do your job. No one, no one wants to see anything stand out. We just want you to read what you're told to read off. And that's not who I am. And that's not to say when other people do it, it's wrong. But I, I have always wanted to be authentically who I am. And if that's not your cup of tea, that's okay. But I think there are a lot of people out there who do appreciate someone being open and honest and real versus not saying anything at all. So I'm not opinionated as in I'm going to speak out against a religion or speak out against politics. Of course I have my moments. Of course I want to say certain things. I do my best to keep it to myself when I know that it could. Anytime you say anything about religion or politics, you have a 50% chance of someone agreeing and 50% chance right. of someone not agreeing. So do I really want to go there? <laughs> not yeah. really, right? Because it's always going to be a debate. And usually the people that dislike you speak the loudest. So I do, I, but yeah, when it comes down to that, I will never, ever, ever deny my faith or or my belief system because someone else doesn't want me to talk about it. I'm not going to do that. People can choose to follow me and listen, or they can choose to not follow me. And then they don't have to see anything I have to post. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's important that people represent who they are. Cause if, if religion is a part of your life and, or whether you want to call it religion or spirituality, then own it. Right. So it's very strong and, and 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 i respect you for that you know for actually holding your ground and not succumbing to some sort of a uh, current trends you know you have your strong beliefs and you're sharing them because you choose to and mm -hmm. that's what uh, keeps you going and that's mm -hmm. great um yeah. and i, I kind of like your quote i think i'm just i'm just gonna use it you know pe people who don't like you speak the loudest and that's actually true like you don't see everyone's like going out there, you know, protecting you in like in the comments, for example, like, Oh, like I love her so much. She's the best. But you see all these assholes who always say the worst possible stuff. Yeah. So it's funny how the psychology works with us. I, uh, someone <laughs> once said to me, someone once said to me, when you go out and you have a, a really nice meal at a restaurant, um, you go home and you probably say, Oh, that was great. Right. That was good food. And then you just go about your evening, you get ready, mm -hmm. you go to bed. But when you go to a restaurant and there's one thing you disliked, right? You're nine out of 10 times, someone's going to go write a review about mm -hmm. how terrible it was because you asked for water and it took five minutes to get your water, but the table right. next to you got the water first. 
Right. You're always going to pinpoint where you fall short. Always. But you're not always going to get praise when you're doing something right. So it's like so important to not always listen to what people are saying. It took me a while to come to that, honestly. Every now and then I like a good clap back. Every now and then it's nice, you know? Mm -hmm. I like to reply to a few haters here and there. Mm -hmm. But overall, the people that are who dislike me are going to be the loudest. Mm -hmm. So I can't just listen to the loud ones just because the others are quiet. There are a lot of people who are going to support you, but they're not always going to be there in the comment section to, you know, take on your battles, which is the ones that are in your comment sections being mean. Now I do my best to filter. I'm, I'm happy to block. I don't have, uh, I'm not someone who's going to be embarrassed to say I blocked a thousand people. I mean, I probably have, (laughs) but the way I for good reason, I don't have to, like, I already have to deal with my own stuff on a day to day basis. We all do. Even, even outside of the pandemic, we all have our crap, right? We have good days. We have bad days. So my mental stability is far more important to me than not blocking somebody. So if I'm coming on my phone that morning, if I grab my phone, yeah, and I'm like, open it up, why would I subject myself to abuse the moment I pick up my phone? Why would I do that? So I had to ask myself, well, what, what's necessary? I'll go on Twitter every now and then. Twitter's the worst, I think. I'll go on Twitter. I have to have it. It's part of my job. I, I put stuff up. Absolutely. But I don't always entirely go scrolling down the comments. I just don't. When I do happen to see one, two, five, whatever, I'll block them because I just don't need to have to have that. Like if you're if you're upset that I get up every day and I do my job and I give you free content on YouTube, mm-hmm. that's on you. But I'm not doing anything wrong. All I'm doing is doing my job. So I filter comments on Instagram. You're allowed to do that now. Uh, you can put keywords and it'll mm-hmm. block it from showing on your page. And I find that I found that tool to be very helpful and I think it was a smart decision on, on behalf of Instagram because mm-hmm. You know, why should you, just because you, you're in front of the camera and you interview fighters and no one signed up to be abused. No one. Right. Fighters didn't sign up to be, so, to be abused on social media. They signed up to entertain you by getting in the ring and risking their lives. And even then, it's not good enough. Do you get what I mean? So right. no one, I didn't sign up to be a boxing reporter for the attention. All of this just came with it, honestly. I was actually really taken aback. Like well, the first time someone asked for my autograph, I'm like, me? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, on, the, on a, on a blub. I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, I'm not a fight. I said, I'm not a fighter. Like I uh-huh. thought maybe they got me confused with somebody. I'm like, no, but you do the interviews. And I'm like, mm-hmm. whoa, that was weird to me. That was a <laughs> moment where I'm like, this is, I didn't do this for the, the gratification of, of being recognized or, or whatever you want to call it. I did it because I love it. And that's ultimately what's taken me into this game so long. Like if it was just about one thing over the other, it would have been very noticeable, but Mm -hmm. I do love what I do. I'm very passionate about it. And I've, and I, when I first started behind the gloves, there were a long time before I was making decent money. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. a lot of times people wouldn't even be in the sport if they weren't being paid. Do you think some of the people on TV right now would be showing up every day because I'm just passionate about boxing, so I just want to do boxing, whatever it is, commentating, reporting, whatever you want to call it. No, Mm -hmm. you're showing up to collect a check. I showed up every day, yes, trying to build something, but it was started from passion. That's the difference. So, yeah, for people who, who want to make assumptions or say whatever they want, you know, I like to say it's water off a duck's ass to me because it doesn't mean anything anymore it maybe it did before but it doesn't anymore honestly it sounds so stressful and i have no idea how are you able to handle this 
Um, but I do know that on your Instagram lives, you, you sometimes talk about stress and, and, you know, dealing with the stress. Do you, have you, uh, incorporated any sort of techniques on how to actually make sure that your mental well being is fine and, and you're being in complete, uh, harmony with yourself and with the world? Yeah. You know what? Um, for many years I neglected it and I think it led up to a moment. I was in, uh, Cancun, Mexico with the WBC. Right. And I, it, it was already building up within myself. I was traveling too much. I wasn't sleeping enough. Uh, my hours are 12 to 14 hours a day. Uh, a lot of people don't see the amount of time that goes into producing one video, not including five to eight a day, plus the social media. Plus, you know, it's a lot of it's yeah. very time consuming. So I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't putting myself first. I was putting my career first. And I, 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 I broke down in Cancun. I absolutely had a bloody meltdown. Like my camera guy was with me and I cried so hard. I was like shaking and I was crying and I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. I was losing it because I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't going to the gym. I was gaining weight and people were calling me out on it. Oh, look at how terrible she looks. Look how fat she's getting. She looks bloated. Uh, look at, oh, she must have had all the surgery on her face. Look how terrible she looks. I mean, it was just like downright nasty. Mm -hmm. And I made the mistake. Actually, at the time I called it a mistake, but it was a blessing in disguise because at the time I believed I made the mistake of reading the comments. I, I, I did a video and I, I never, ever, I swear to you, on, on YouTube, I, don't, I, do not re I do not read the comments. They're the worst, right? Mm -hmm. So one day I made the mistake of doing it and I was already in a bad space mentally. I was already worn out, not feeling good about myself, not eating right, not sleeping right, not doing enough for myself. And I snapped. I had a moment where I snapped. I was hysterically crying. Um, my cameraman, Brandon, was there with me. And I just remember he he literally just put his arms around me and held me as I was like shaking, crying. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. He didn't even know what to, how to sort of react to that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to react to it. I didn't know I was going to break down like that, but I, it clicked with me. You know, things only bother you if you believe it. Mm -hmm. Did I believe I gained weight? Yeah. Did I believe I didn't look as good as I could have? Yeah. Not that it has everything to do with the appearance, but it's, it, was, it was deeper than that. It was, you're not taking care of yourself. You're not feeling good about yourself. If you ate better, if you slept more, if you took time for yourself to go see your family and be with them, if you exercised, all of those factors are important for your mental health. And I wasn't doing any of them. So that's why their words affected me. So... The next day, I had these, um, you know, like the sauna suits. I love, yeah. I love working out in the sauna suits. Me too. Uh, I had some WBC sauna suits um, that used to belong to Gennady Golovkin, believe it or not, because their camp gave them to me because they were an extra, an extra set. Wait, so you, were, you, were, you, were, you were wearing Triple G sauna suit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently I was. Um, so I had, uh, I, I put the suit on, and at, while everyone's going to the beach and everyone's like uh, joining poolside, I would, I started, you know, walking myself down past the pool to the gym. And I was working out for about an hour in the sweatsuit, just absolutely just sweating. I mean, when I got up, I felt like water just, it was like peeing yourself because there was so much water coming down your legs. Mm -hmm. And I, it was that moment where it all changed, where now I will go to the gym. I will put myself first. I start after last year, because uh, I already had two months bookings in advance for travel. Mm -hmm. When it was Christmas time, and I, I tapped out all of January. All of mm -hmm. January I was out because mm -hmm. I was like, there's no way I have to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And I stayed home. I was with my family. And even early February, it was still a challenge to get back at it. But I needed that. And so because of what people said, at the time, it was hurtful, but it, in reality, when I reflect back on it, I'm glad it happens because it 
it made me realize, you know what, I need to take care of myself. So mm -hmm. I do make sure I do that, take my vitamins, get my sleep. Most importantly, I made a rule to myself that I wouldn't go longer than six weeks without seeing my family. It doesn't matter what part of the world I'm in. I will fly home to see my family because they are so important to me that not seeing them is like drains my soul. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I'm not the best version of myself when I'm away from them too long. Right. Can, can we talk about beauty for a second? Well, first of all, I think you look stunning all the time in front of the camera. I don't know what you're talking about. So always flawless. But here's like a little bit of my insight. I, so I started this podcast. It was, like a, it was like a freaking you know audio podcast, no video. Then I was like, all right, screw it. Let's do video. Yeah. And then I'm all of a sudden I'm realizing, oh, like, okay. So the hair is not right. The color is not popped. Like all of those little details. And you're like, you know, like, ah, yeah, like... All of a sudden, you're realizing, okay, I need like, well, not I need, but like I realize why people need like, a, 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 like a, a makeup, you know, person, a costume designer, or something like. Th those things are really like cutting through your eyes when you look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just one thing. Uh, and so all of a sudden, I'm like, wow. And can you imagine being on camera pretty much 24/7 and 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 looking, you know, good, just good, just you know, just just properly dressed you know properly you know makeup whatever everything is just in in its like place it's actually very hard to maintain like i'm just realizing that right now and i'm a guy like i don't even use makeup but like my hair is always messed up i don't i don't do like a barbershop or anything everything's close so like it's all kind of like all over the place and then look at you right now you, you you're just flawless right now but that's and i'm not okay so i'm not like making a compliment or which i am but like it's not the point the point is can we stop apologizing for uh or like should the reporters start apologizing for actually looking good on camera because i see a lot uh in boxing is like well she's just beautiful she's just pretty like yeah she is and you think you like you just described how hard it is to be in shape and it's crazy hard to be in shape. you try to be in shape you'll be looking at all this you know people who are not in shape on, on camera you know they're not trying and and it's just basically human psychology it's pleasant to look at good looking people on tv like that's just how it is and it's not some like no one like it's a hard work to look good on tv and i feel like a lot of people don't realize that i don't know i just wanted to do this little rant for a long time <laughs> no, you know what i agree because often i will you know every now and then i and i always I always reply back to that. Well, not always, but sometimes I reply back to the, the person who says it. But there is always one comment, uh, it, it, whether it be on my Twitter or on my Instagram, my Facebook. There's always one comment. I go, oh, well, you wouldn't be where you're at if you were ugly. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is I can't – I'm not going to apologize for being – who I am, looking how I look. Do I like to take care of myself? Yes. Do I like to get up and get dressed and do it? Yeah, for the most part. Not, of course, there's always the off few days. You don't want to do anything. But yeah, I do like to feel a certain way about myself. Um, but to be criticized for wearing too much makeup, for dressing like this, dressing like... Do you know, if I really wanted to with my following i if i really was trying to egg it about sexuality i could really be egging it mm -hmm. like in fact i'm limiting myself because i don't do it most people are like oh girl you need to play it up while you're young you got to play up the sexuality while you're young if you if you can get that attention and get them views and, and get those job you know those endorsements then do it mm -hmm. but it's not about that this is just who i am since I was 18 years old, I've been wearing eyelashes. I'm not apologizing for it. I like four to five inch heels. I like to feel a certain way. I like jewelry. I like makeup. What's wrong with that? That's just who I am. If someone else looks natural and more natural than me and, and does what I do, and who cares? What, what, what does it matter whether one person likes to dress up more than the other? Like, what does that have to do with the, the job I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, sometimes you're, you're, you're showing cleavage. I am a woman and we do have cleavage. Am I supposed, even if I dressed like a nun, like I could wear, com I could be completely covered up and it'll be absolutely nothing to do with that. They'll find another reason to talk about or complain about. So like I said, your haters are the loudest mm -hmm. and that's the thing. You just have to accept it. It is what it is.
people who know me, people who work with me, people who see me around, they know what I'm about. And that's all that matters to me. I'm not here for the gratification of someone, you know, saying, oh, she's this or she's that. I, I, is it, is it, does it feel good sometimes to hear, oh, you look nice? What woman, what woman would say no? What men would say no? Right. It's everyone's, yeah, everyone wants it. You know, and it, and it, oh, you only get the views you get because guys, you know, give you attention. Okay, well, I only watch Brad Pitt's movies because I like Brad Pitt. Exactly. I'm well, you, you go I with, uh, watch Chris Hemsworth movies. I'll watch anything he's in just <laughs> because I like to look at him. I will go. And that's and, the point. Like, that's why they I are. I watch act- Brad Pitt's movies. Just to see Brad Pitt. It doesn't matter what the storyline is. I, I watched that one movie, which was really boring, but it wasn't boring because I was staring at the love of my life. Like, on camera, it was, it was not boring for two hours because, well, quite frankly, it was nice to look at him. If that is, do you think that movie studios care about how great an actor is as opposed to will the women go watch him? Of course. Business. Business. So what's wrong with... A woman who is intelligent, speaks well, delivers her questions well, has passion for the sport, and might look a a certain way that maybe men want to tune in. What is wrong with other women in this sport, sports in general? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. I have so many female friends across the board in various sports who are drop-dead gorgeous, who love to talk about sports. But why is it subjected down to one thing? Why is it always because, oh, well, because she's got a nice butt or she's got a nice boobs or, oh, look at her. She, she's always flirting with him because she's smiling. Mm-hmm. Like, it's unbelievable. It's always something. But again, of course, it comes down to sexism. That's a whole different topic that I don't even care to get into because, quite frankly, it's a lose-lose situation for women in, in many industries. It, mm-hmm. it goes into every industry. It's not just sports. It's every industry. but. What's important is that you know where you're going in life. You know who you are. You know that you're not out sleeping around with people to get jobs. That's Mm -hmm. what matters. That ultimately is what matters. So my best advice to other women, because I've had other women, I actually mentor a few at the moment who are up and coming. And I say the same thing to them because they go through the same things that I went through when I first started. I still go through them, but I think I'm just better at reacting towards it. I say the same thing to them. Like, you know what, babe, you just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing because they're always going to be there. And so long as you have talent and the ability to do a good job, you are going to be fine. It does not matter. I think, like I said, one of the best, one of the best things I say all the time is, or one of the best things I've heard, I'm sorry, that I often repeat is it's water off a duck's ass. Mm -hmm. Does not matter. You know, let's, so let's dive in a little bit into the meta of uh, your channel. And again, I think your channel speaks for itself in terms of numbers, no matter what people say, like you do have over 200,000 subscribers for boxing. It's, it's just unimaginable numbers for, for a YouTube channel. I, I, it's, it's just, you know, it's crazy. And, uh, and you have millions and millions of views. And so no matter what people say, there is a, there is a demand for it and you're fulfilling that demand and you're providing that content and, and you do provide. Again, you provide real content. You provide boxing content. You you not you don't do like a, you know, I don't know some rants or whatever. You actually go out there and you do the leg work and all of that. So which I want to talk about because, at the I, I read some of your interviews and and you said that at the beginning you've you've spent so much money, uh, like you invested a lot of money into that to create that content. It's, it includes the hotel, the flights, and the equipment, all of that plus. Uh, I was so pleasantly surprised when you said like, oh, I also did my own editing. I did all of that by myself. Like it's just so, because I'm, I'm doing this right now and I'm realizing, wow, this is just some hard stuff. Like to just yeah. put everything together. So I don't know. How was that for you? And how did you handle that? I mean, anyone would actually would quit at that time, but like just going through that uh, investment of time and money into this whole thing. When I look back on it, the first few years, it's a big blur. Mm -hmm. I almost wish that I documented more. I wish that I wrote in journals and, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, documented the experiences because it was so overwhelming and tiresome 
mm-hmm. and frustrating. And this is at a time when YouTubers were, we're still fighting for our place in media, mm-hmm. but it's definitely gotten easier recently than when we, back in those days, nine years ago, where, when we first started out, YouTubers were like, well, what do you do exactly? What are you doing? Where are you, where are you putting this? Mm-hmm. And I remember like at the time that like, you, you were never guaranteed an interview. Not saying you are now, but especially being a YouTuber, you were, they were like, no, we don't have to do interviews with them. Right. And it was a fight, very challenging fight to be respected. It's still taking, it's still taking me years. I mean, I still have people come up to me and say, Oh, I hear what they say about you. And I'm like, are they still talking about me? Like after all these years, they still have to question like my work ethic and everything I've done. Like, I realize it's never going to end and, and that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'll probably Mm -hmm. never, ever get the credit I deserve, but I don't care to get praise from other people. I care ultimately about how far I've come personally. Mm -hmm. So I'll continue to, to do that for myself. But it was a, yeah, it was a big blur. I, I, I probably would say I had what felt like a mental breakdown at least once a month because it was overwhelming. I would cry a lot. Oh my God, I need help, but I don't have money to ha- have help. And mm-hmm. so I started bringing on interns. And then even with interns, it was like always a learning curve. You always had to invest so much time into them to get them to learn and mm-hmm. understand how this works. And so the training process of it. And then rely like, on them. You doing your, own, yeah, relying on them. Are they, are they reliable? Are they consistent? It was, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but I proved it could be done, you know, like I know there are a lot of other people who have done the same thing. We all started in the same place. We all had the same challenges and crossroads and, and a lot of us has gone on to do some really great things. Mm -hmm. Uh, We all started from just, you know, one subscriber and now we're doing television. So that should say a lot, but I, um, yeah, looking back and doing it alone, I don't do enough of this reflecting to be honest with you. I probably should because it's, and it, I was hoping that you would do it here. And I'm grateful yeah, put for things that. in perspective because when you live in a bubble, you forget, you don't see what everyone else sees. You see, oh, I need to do more. My numbers need to be better. I need to be there. I can't stay home. I, I should be, I should, I should have gotten that job. Why did that person get that job? You're hard on yourself. It's never going to. Would you say you're your own worst critic? hundred percent. Oh my God. I'm the worst. I am terrible. In fact, I'm so terrible to myself that sometimes my best friend says, stop talking about my friend like that. Like, <laughs> cause I'm talking to myself that way. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm getting better though. I promise I'm getting better. I've, I've really, like I said, I've had a realization about a lot of things and and how important it is to take care of yourself. And I wasn't doing that, like I said, but when I do look back and, and think about how far I've come, I mean, we're about to hit a hundred million views on YouTube. Wow. 105, four or 5,000 subscribers. Um, I, I was the first in YouTube, uh, from my understanding on, in terms of boxing reporters, the first on YouTube to, to, to trans or to, crossover into television when I got yeah. the World boxing super series job. There's so much that I should pat myself on the back for. Um, and I'm, and I'm grateful because along the way, once I finally did start to get a team, they're a big part of that. It's, I didn't, I might've started this on my own, but I'm not on my own. Like I have a lot of help right now. Um, well, at the moment, it's a, there's three, there's three of us, me and two other people, but, uh, but nonetheless, yeah, it's, it's nice to reflect back and kind of think about how far you've come because it's so easy to forget. You know, I really liked your little post on, well, not little, you actually wrote an article uh, on Facebook about yourself, basically kind of, it was actually a relatively recent one, several months ago you wrote, and it was really helpful for me and for my preparation for this. Um, have you considered actually and I know that you wrote several articles, and but have you considered to actually maybe write a book about you know your experience and your journey? I feel like within you've been around 
boxing industry for more than eight years, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there's a there's something in there with, with that you can actually ref do like that reflection and put it on the like on the page somewhere and do a yeah, book about it? Yeah, I, I think I'm probably still some years off of that. But again, back to wishing I documented it more and journaled more. Probably mm -hmm. would have made the writing process easier to kind of go back to very specific moments and recall them. They mm -hmm. kind of just float back into my mind. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember when that happened. Oh yeah, I remember when this happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I get along with, I like to think I get along with everybody right now in boxing, but there was a time, I'm not going to mention names because mm -hmm. we're actually all okay right now. Mm -hmm. but there was a time when I was very disliked amongst uh, a group of people who really had it out for me. They, Why do you think that was? Just jealousy? Just the hate? I don't know because I don't want to say it's jealousy, but I don't, and, and I don't know why I was hated, mm -hmm. but I think that sometimes people don't like what they can't control. Mm. I've sort of always come in and been my own self. Like I never tried to fit into any groups. I never tried to format myself to meet other people's standards. I've always just been myself. And oftentimes those people, people like myself kind of get misread and I've always been very kind. I've always said I was never going to give anybody a reason to dislike me. So even though girls were being mean and spreading rumors mm -hmm. about me and talking mm -hmm. about me, um, I always said, I'm never going to give them a reason to dislike me. And that one day they're going to realize that they are the reason. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not the reason they're the reason. So you kill them with kindness, don't you? Right. And that's what I've done over the years. Um, the initial, I, th I think the, I think the rumor initially when I first came on was, oh, she's here to meet men. She just wants to find a husband. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that narrative has been shut down because trust me, there could have been opportunities for me to mm -hmm. uh, move in that direction. I personally, I'm not here for that. I was here for the, the love of what I do. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's not something people still think because if that was the case, I mean, I've been doing this nine years. I, I could have been married or in, in, in a committed relationship, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. So uh, at least within my, my field. So, right. Um, so yeah, I mean, God, this thing's got me got looking way back now. It, it, times were hard. Times are very difficult and it was bittersweet. It's to see that when more women were coming on the scene, that they didn't have it this, as hard as I had it. So it's bittersweet because a part of me was like, damn, why couldn't you guys be nice to me when I first came on? Why were you guys so mean to me? Mm -hmm. And then now other women are coming here and they're, they're almost embraced. Oh, women in sports. Yeah, women it's in sports. trendy now. Yeah, but the, yeah, but the, the ones that were here a while back, like why, would, why was it so hard for us? So mm -hmm. like I said, it's bittersweet. I'm happy that, they're, they're becoming more open to having women in, the, in this industry. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a challenge to, to get a reaction, to get sort of this respect that mm -hmm. some people got almost instantly when they came on. So, so yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about, you know, your style and, and, and I know, and I read that you pride yourself on actually establishing the relationships, uh, you know, where, you know, you're establishing that trust in the business, uh, where, you know, people trust you within the business. They allow you that, that access to professionals, to the athletes or to like different executives. Do you, uh, what kind of strategies do you implement in that, in that sense? How do you make sure that, you know, people that you need to work with, you know, trusting you? I like to think that that's, a part of your character to begin with because I don't have a vindictive nature about me. I'm not going to talk to you and get to know you to go to someone else and talk about you. That's not my nature. And I think that's why I've been able to have friendships as long as I've had them. I mean, we're talking about 15, 20 years. I've had really close friends. I think, I think, if you're not a trustworthy person, you wouldn't be able to maintain relationships across the board. Um, so I like to think that people can sense within me that I'm not that way. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I hope that I, I'd like to think that's that's the case because when I'm in camp with one person, you won't talk you won't catch me talking about the other person's camp that I was just in. Right. Do you know what I mean? So I, I've always maintained that balance. It does get tricky though. Uh, sometimes they start to feel like you're hanging out with one more than the other. Oh, are you on their team? Mm -hmm. It does get tricky, but I like to nip it in the butt. And I like to say all the time, like, you guys do realize, like, I'm on no one's side here. Like, I respect everyone. I, I get to know their families and I, and, I, and I love them. And you wish the best for people. And I want to think that that is why I've developed so many strong relationships in this field it's because I'm not here to like gossip about you or, or find out what I can and go write an article about it and throw you under the bus for this or that. Do you get what I mean? So right. plus it, time reveals all. Mm -hmm. And if you're consistent and if you're a good person and if you show yourself to be loyal in time, you've proven that. People don't have to question it. And mm -hmm. so I think that's why I've been able to sort of forge these relationships. Mm -hmm. When you work with boxers and, you know, you, you work as a journalist, you ask them questions. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what questions do boxers want to be asked? Because I personally know that boxers don't like to be asked a lot of questions. And there's very little that they do like to, to respond to. Uh, what do you think it's really about for them uh, based on your experience? I think they want to be asked a question that's fair. It's a, it's a fair playing field. Um, for example, if, uh, if I was interviewing Deontay Wilder, I'd ask him a question that doesn't sound judgmental, but it leaves him an opportunity to give his side to a story. Mm -hmm. I don't care what he says. He could slate the other person as much as he wants. I don't intervene. I don't um, challenge them on it. It's his opinion. But at the same time, I'll go back and speak to like Anthony Joshua and mm -hmm. give him the opportunity to say what he wants to say about it. I think it's just about being fair. Um, you pretty much know right off the bat when someone asks a question, if they already have a motive behind it, I think it's pretty mm -hmm. easy to read between the lines. It's not what you say. It's also how you say it. So sometimes I'm accused of being too nice. Uh, you should have asked him this. You should have said that. I hear that a lot, mm -hmm. but I like to be fair. I like to ask a question that gives them the free range to say what they want to say. Mm -hmm. And I'm not there to dispute it or argue with them about it because I don't have a motive. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question because that's. Right. And so I, I would say then, uh, would you say like an open-ended question where you give the opportunity to elaborate for, for the boxer? Yeah. Uh, give them a chance to say what they need to say, not, not, not ask a question in a way that puts them in a corner where you're like, well, no, wait a minute. You're not mm -hmm. asking me. You're kind of accusing me. Right. It's funny. Do you think like during fight week, it's so much tougher to ask questions or I don't know. It's, it's just, it's, it's different when you're asking questions uh, before fight week, before the fight, because it's a different sort of, you're talking to a different person during the fight week. Yeah. Oh, I say that all the time. Yeah. I'm like, Are you mindful of that? It's, yeah, it's tough sometimes because you're, you don't know what you're getting from them, but nine out of 10 times, you're definitely not getting personality. And if you do, it's just trash talk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? So I always enjoy doing interviews when, when the guys are out of camp, that's when you're getting, I guess, a, a better picture of who they are. Right. Speaking of uh, Anthony Joshua, I, I listened to a podcast uh, that you were on. Uh, you were you were talking about Saudi Arabia and going going to Joshua Reese uh, uh, to fight, and you were basically speculating like I don't know what other rules, I don't know how it's going to work out. So fast forward, you you went to Saudi Arabia, you went to that fight, and I was wondering uh, if you can share your experience on going to Saudi Arabia, and then I'm gonna my next question will be about Russia as well. Uh, Saudi Arabia was such a magical thing to experience. What I have ever thought in a million years 
that I would be going to Saudi Arabia? No, because back when I was young, even just up until what, a year ago, they weren't even accepting visitor visas or mm -hmm. uh, tourist visas. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a country that was almost forbidden to, to enter into unless you were invited in. So mm -hmm. now that we are able to actually be into this mysterious land, I didn't know what to expect. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a dangerous place, the internet, because a lot of information that's put out is not correct. You know, and, and it's like to, to have been there firsthand, to have seen how it operates. Uh, again, I'm not going to condemn or judge anyone for how culturally they're different mm -hmm. and religious, you know, religious uh, values, everything's different from what, I, from what I'm accustomed to, at least. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that I was respectful because I'm not there to be the one that's like, oh, look, I'm a woman, hear me roar. I'm showing my arms, I'm gonna show you guys. I'm, I'm not that person, I'm very respectful. You, if, if the culture is against it, mm -hmm. if they're against certain things, if they feel that it's, it's uh, disrespectful, I'm not gonna go against it. So I, I chose to dress in traditional garments even though you were allowed to wear uh, certain clothing, regular clothing. I kind of like the traditional style that you, that you wore. It was pretty cool. It was fun. I was like, ooh, when am I going to get to wear this again? Maybe, maybe a year from now, maybe we'll start doing this more regularly. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that they, everyone was very accommodating from the moment I stepped off the plane. Mm -hmm. uh, people have, they had a warm spirit about them. Nothing, I can honestly say, if I, I'm just going to be blunt about it. I can honestly say I, I expected there to be more judgment. I expected there to be more resistance mm -hmm. uh, towards foreigners, towards women, mm -hmm. because that's all I read about. Right. All, now, I'm not saying that's not what's happening in that country. I by no means am saying that. I'm saying from my personal experience, I never encountered anything negative. The only thing that I found odd, because I'm not, obviously I'm not used to this, is when you go into a restaurant, there's uh, a cashier women pay and mm -hmm. a cashier men pay. So mm -hmm. I've never experienced segregation ever in my life. So mm. that was interesting. Um, and then when you go into a restaurant, some of them were all male. They, mm -hmm. uh, one restaurant made the exception for me because mm -hmm. I was American and mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a new, it's basically, this is all new to them. They're, right. they're not used to it as much as I'm not used to it. So we're all sort of just experiencing something new, right? Mm -hmm. So when I walked into the restaurant, he said, if, if I can please sit you to the side, mm -hmm. of course. We got, we got sat off with two guys, got sat off to the side, and everyone was staring like, hmm. there's a woman in here. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure that women obviously don't eat at that restaurant who are locals. So, but never did I experience anyone being rude to my face. Uh, the men, if I asked them a question, they answered it. It wasn't like, I'm not talking to you. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. basically everything I thought I was going to experience, I didn't. The food was by far the best food I've ever had in my life, ever. Now, I'm, I'm definitely someone you could say has been around the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm telling you right now, best food ever is in Saudi Arabia. Best food ever. What do they, uh, what do they usually, what's the dish there? Oh, they have all types of dishes, but it's just, everything's made with such rich flavor. Hmm. So I love flavor and I love spicy food. All types. So everybody who went to Saudi, you can ask mm -hmm. anyone. They're like, oh man, the food was amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. We all experienced how great the food was. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was different and I'm happy to have done it. I know that a lot of 
women chose not to attend that fight. Which is funny because I listened to your podcast again uh, when you were a guest on the show. Uh, you sort of presented two sides of the uh, argument where women journalists don't want to go to Saudi Arabia as, as, a, as an act of protest against the, uh, for violations of human rights, uh, etc., And, uh, but there's another side of the coin where you actually want to go there as a female American journalist, sort of despite that and kind of like to, to show them like, Hey, like, you know, we're going to go to your land. We're going to do our job. Like there's like a good It argument for both represents sides. Change. Exactly. Isn't that what we're hoping for? We're hoping for change. So why would I not be a part of that? Whether mm -hmm. you want to call it a movement or not, why would I not want to partake in what was not allowed a year ago for a mm -hmm. woman to be attending sporting events for a woman to be drive working. a car yeah exactly so a, a woman couldn't even you know work why would i not want to partake in that like movement in the in 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 the right direction mm -hmm. do you know what i mean mm -hmm. So yeah, I chose to do it and I'm glad I did it. And it was a wonderful experience and I'm not here to speak on behalf of, of, you know, the civil rights violations because quite frankly, I don't have enough information um, to give an educated response to it. Uh, but I'm happy to see that there, there is development in the right direction Mm -hmm. to allow women to start doing more. Mm -hmm. uh, and a question, as I said, about, about your trip to Russia. Uh, anything memorable about that? I know it's not as flavorful as, as Saudi Arabia, but I was wondering if there's some, some tidbits that you can uh, no, share. It was amazing just because to have partaked in a part of history with... And, and just, I'm from Kazakhstan, by the way, so you don't have to okay. be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, to have partaked in in uh, history with, you know, the, the World Boxing Super Series to have hosted on uh, pay-per-view. Uh, it was everything I've worked my butt off for. Right, because for you personally, it was a huge step career-wise. Career-wise, uh, to, to be right there experiencing it, to... Like, again, it, I partaked in history, and that was such a big deal. But overall, even in Russia, like, I loved Moscow and Sochi. Sochi, mm -hmm. so, so beautiful. Like, I didn't expect all of the water, and <laughs> it was just so, like, the, the mountains and the snow on the mountains. I mean, it was just very scenic. It was gorgeous. Um, mm -hmm. Moscow was fun. I know that the Super Series held like a, a night out for us. And, oh, I bet that was really fun. Oh, it was a lot <laughs> of fun. It was a lot of fun. However, I did, I was probably one of the first to go home because What? Uh, my, my, or go back to my room because anyone who knows me knows I enjoy to go out. Like I love, di like I love fine dining, going uh -huh. to lounges, having a drink, right? It's the social stuff. Right. But, I'm not the person that can go out, out, as they say. Like, I don't go out, out. I go out. But you don't, I don't rage. Go I don't rage. I don't <laughs> party. What's your favorite drink? I, I love whiskey. Um, I love whiskey, but... Neat or I'm, rocks? If I'm going out, like, I'm having, let's say it's a friend's, like, birthday or bachelorette or something, and we're all, like, we, uh -huh. you know, you really got to, like, turn up a little bit. Uh -huh. it, would be, it would be tequila. Nice. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I can't do that on like a regular. I can't, I can't. I, oh, yeah. in fact, I don't even drink on a regular. Uh -huh. uh, I found when I moved to Manchester, England, that I drank more wine than I've ever drank in my life. And Ooh. that was because my roommate loves wine. So she's always popping a bottle open and, and every <laughs> night we'll have a glass, right? And then it started turning into like, we're doing a bottle a night between her and I. That's like two glasses a night. And I was like, all right, this is... No, 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 because it's, it's, there's a lot of sugar in that. And I'm like, I'm not going to start. Yeah, this. that's why I drink tequila. It's just so good yeah. for like just, it, it has less sugar. It's, it's better for a dietary and it just turns you up really quickly and fast and effectively. <laughs> it does. I can't have, I can't have uh, vodka. I hate vodka. Like yeah, if yeah, that was the only thing sitting on the table, I won't touch it. <laughs> 
listen, I'm going to let you go very soon. I'm sorry. It's, it's taken more than an hour and I'm, I, I bet you're pretty tired from this, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask you, I, you spent so much time with Tyson Fury and his team. And, and not only as a reporter who interviews him, but also you guys had like a, a project together. And I don't recall what it was. I think it was a presentation of his book. And it was like a Q&A kind of thing that you, you would travel with his team uh, around England, around Great Britain. Can you talk to me about that experience and how was yeah. that for you? So basically what it was, was... Um gold star promotions over in england they do a lot of like an evening with so it's like an evening right right not a book i'm sorry yeah floyd mayweather an evening with you know anthony joshua like they do it with everybody as well as like football stars and so forth but i basically i only do the boxing stuff so uh i was asked to do i've done several i've done i've done them with uh tony bellew um Oh my God, I can't even uh, think right now. Tony Bellew, Floyd Mayweather, uh, Tommy Hearns. Wow. Uh, obviously Tyson Fury. God, mm. there's so, I'm drawing a blank right now. I can't even think. But uh, anyways, what you do is, you know, I get up in front of a thousand people and we sit on a stage and we we talk. We just basically talk. And it's been a lot of fun. I, I definitely, I've always known Tyson, but uh -huh. this really allowed us all to really develop. Like we became a family. We were uh -huh. on the road and it was a lot. I, I don't know how musicians do tours from. Yeah. I was surprised because it's exhausting. Like we were literally in bu like buses going up and down the country everywhere. So like Doing one the same night thing. we're in, yeah, one night we're in Scotland, the other night we're in Wales, the other night we're in London. It was just like, it was all over the place, right? Uh -huh. So, um, very little sleep. The, the guys love to get up super early in the morning. And it's mm -hmm. so funny because we're always all within the same block, right? Mm -hmm. So in the morning, I just, they'll ask me the night before, are you going to go running with us? And I know, I told you I don't run. Like, no, I'm not, ru I'm not running. <laughs> And so I'll literally hear everyone getting up in the morning because, you know, it's the hallway, everyone's loud. You get uh -huh. a pound on the door like, that's you coming. <laughs> and so no. So no. Yeah, that was like an extra hour of sleep I could have had. And they just woke me up, <laughs> puts me off. And there was a lot of that. There was a lot of jokes. Um, I was picked on all the time because I was basically the only woman on tour. Do they call you Phelps? Yeah, 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 they do. They call me Phelps. Phelps or Phelpsy. That's what they call me. <laughs> Um, I like it. It, oh. it was so much fun. Like, I can't wait till we can all do it again. I'm hearing that Tyson might do another tour. Well, he was supposed to do another tour uh -huh. at the end of this year or mid to late this year. But now given the circumstances, I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen. By the me. way, don't you love Tyson's Instagram right now? I freaking love it. Like the morning workouts, the routines. Yeah. The, oh, it's well, just that's like what I'm that's what it was. It was morning workouts. It was breakfast. It was, we're on the road. We check into the hotels. It was, we all, we all ate dinner together. It was time to go to the venue, no, go get ready, go to the venue. And then it was the, you know, the Q and A, the meet and greet. And then we did it all over and we all got food at the end of the night. That's it, literally the same thing again and again and again and again. <laughs> and it was, it was a lot of fun, but uh, one thing I will say is I really respect and, and rate Tyson Fury's, you know, uh, like discipline. Right. Far more disciplined than I was. Far more. I mean, he should. I mean, he's an athlete. I'm not. Mm -hmm. But still, his discipline was very impressive. I was, I respected it a lot because, you know, it didn't matter what time he went to sleep. He was up the next morning running. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it mm -hmm. was to see that he knew he needed to to keep himself and that same regimen to keep his mentality strong mm -hmm. was right. just really kind of, it was looking back. It was really, really cool to witness that because I'm sure 10, 15, 20 years from now, when these guys goes down as some of the biggest legends of the sport, mm -hmm. you know, to when our grandkids are watching boxing, you know, it's cool to look back and say that I've had these experiences. Like, it's really quite surreal. And I, I don't do that enough. And I'm kind of cool that I'm glad that you're asking me to sort of reflect because I don't do it enough. And the amount of stuff I've experienced 
And again, I was just a girl with a goal, just a girl mm-hmm. with a vision mm-hmm. to say that I've traveled to 23 different countries since being a part of the boxing community to say that I've, my team and I have been able to achieve what we have. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Incredible. It's incredible. It's, I feel very blessed, very grateful to have been able to, to do all of this. That's beautiful. Uh, Michelle, just last question. What should we expect from you? Do you have any uh, plans that you want to reveal right now? And if not, it's fine. Like you're still providing a lot of content, by the way. I'm still surprised that you're just pumping that thing out on your YouTube channel. There's always something. Uh, it's just crazy. Are you working you know, on something? The, I, I had a lot of other stuff going on. And, you know, I was, I was slowly transitioning into entertainment hosting. Um, because that's, that's why I moved to LA in the first place was to try my hand at acting and entertainment hosting. And I was able to cover, you know, the, the golden globes, a star Trek movie premiere of several other things. And it was, it was really fun. Wow. Okay. Didn't know that. Yeah. To work some of those those events. So there was a lot more that I was supposed to do, but Uh, then the world shut down. So, um, hopefully, you know, once that's back, I hope to to do more of entertainment hosting as well, mm-hmm. as well as continue to develop my podcast. I know right now it's just been nothing but interviews, but the ultimate goal is I really want to, to talk about, you know, UFOs, conspiracy theory. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> I did not expect that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm huge on that. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that wow, okay. we have to trust real neighbors and I... I have so many stories growing up because I grew up in a haunted house. So <laughs> it sort of led to this fascination of the, the afterlife and ghost hunting. And, and so there's, there's so many questions I have and, and things that I'm interested in sort of learning more about and, and doing it with also other people, maybe talking to other people who've experienced things themselves. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, wow, I, I, okay. I, I sort of want to angle my podcast a little bit more in that direction. I'm all right for now, it. That sounds incredible. Let's yeah, do this, right please. Now, yeah, <laughs> right now, I just want to, you know, we're getting it going. I'm trying to get the subs up. I'm trying to stay proactive because mm-hmm. there really isn't much boxing news, but I'm doing my best. Um, my other correspondent, Fouad, he's, you know, he's killing it on his end too. We're doing the best we can. We can't force people to tune in and watch, but we could, right. as long as we keep the consistency of content going, then, then so be it. Um, but yeah, so aside from that, we'll see. There, there was some pretty exciting stuff. I can't really speak about it now, but I will say that there's been a sort of keen interest from a TV network in the UK. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, they're, they're UK and US based. Uh, to, to talk a little bit more about potentially doing some television presenting, like some hosting stuff. Awesome. That is not inboxing. So it would it would sort of take me a little bit out of it. But no matter what, I feel like I'm in a position now to kind of, you know, do both. I've put a lot of time into boxing, but if I can sort of dabble here and there in the entertainment world of hosting, I think that, I think I can do really well with that because it's, you know, very conversational and fun and, and, and they're not judging you if you look good on camera. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But we'll see. Right. And Michelle, you know, I, I always thought that, you know, you're, you're such a deep person and you have so much more to offer uh, beyond what you're already giving us, the fans, in terms of boxing. And I hope that in this podcast, I was able to surface that just a little bit for, for everyone who is watching and who is listening. And I feel like if, if we did that just a little bit, I feel like that's a great success. And personally, I am so happy and so grateful for, uh, for our conversation because you really showed yourself. Uh, you basically, I don't know, delivered so much joy to me. Uh, just by talking, you know, on about serious subjects, really. Um, And so I really appreciate that. Well, you know what? I appreciate you uh, having me on. This has been fun. And it's always nice because I don't, don't really talk about, you know, my life and stuff. So it's kind of cool that you, you're sort of taking me down memory lane a bit to, to think about all the things that, you know, have transpired and the good and the bad. And, so I appreciate that. It's been it's been nice. And you know, hopefully people can 
look at this and say, you know, she did it, I can do it. And, and hopefully it was a positive, ultimately in the end, a positive message. So thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you so much. Michelle Joy Phelps, everyone.